where we are today. Wow. That's a big topic to discuss. That but is. It's an important topic. Where, where would you like me to start? <laughs> <Well> <laughs> at the beginning. Well, you know, gun control, when, when the framers of the Constitution wrote up the uh, Bill of Rights, the Second Amendment was the second for a reason. Uh, because that was to prevent tyranny from uh, the government overthrowing the citizens again when they escaped rule, British rule. Right. And uh, for a lot of people out there who are libertarians, they have to realize that the First Amendment would not exist if not for the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. And gun control was pretty light in this country for most of our growth except during the Emancipation Proclamation, which I'll get into in a minute. But the real screws were turned in this country after 1968, after the high-profile assassinations of Martin Luther King and Bobby right. Kennedy. And that's when our, our country passed very, very restrictive uh, gun laws. Uh, to, to hurt, you know, law-abiding citizens exactly. from getting guns, not criminals, because criminals don't follow any laws. But uh, I, I, was, I was raised Catholic, and uh, I'm a life member of an organization called Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be Jewish to be a member. And they equate gun control with genocide, and history has repeated itself over Absolutely. and over again. And they have a great video uh, called No Guns for Negroes. And uh, everybody should watch this video. It's on YouTube, too. You don't yes, even have is. to buy the DVD. But after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, before the 15th, Amend 15th Amendment was enacted, uh, the southern states basically turned the screws on the emancipated slaves, and they weren't allowed to vote because they had to pay a polling tax. You weren't about to move freely unless you owned property. Mm -hmm. You couldn't own guns unless you owned property. So in essence, the slaves were still slaves. Absolutely. And then the 15th Amendment was enacted by Congress. It was completely pushed through after Brown versus Board of Education in 65. But for a 100-year period, most of your uh, blacks were discriminated on. They, they, they couldn't get guns. Right, so here they were free men, but they had no way to protect themselves. Could, could not protect, exactly, they exactly. They couldn't protect themselves. So when the mobs came to your house, what, what is a man to do to protect they, himself they, and they, his family? They couldn't do anything. absolutely nothing. They couldn't do anything. And today, modern gun control, if you look at the cities and states with the most restrictive gun control, mm -hmm. it's the highest density of population of minorities still. And, like, we have our governor, Governor Christie, uh, says that uh, New Jersey can't have less restrictive gun laws because we're different. And I read into that. What he means is we're different is no guns for minorities. You know, most of the, the cities that restrict most gun control have a high density of minorities. And w I'm on the board of the New Jersey Second Amendment Society, right. and we're fighting uh, to get rid of the restrictive laws and tests that they've implemented in cities. And most of it is cities that have a high population of minorities. So minorities can't protect themselves. Well, cor <laughs> well yeah, they're, they're, they're not prepared to protect no, themselves. We're going to restrict them. And we're trying to wake that sleeping giant up because, you know, the majority of the law-abiding citizens, min minority or not, deserve their right to, to exercise their Second Amendment in this country. Absolutely. And it's quite a process to go through. So it, it's not easy to say, oh, I want to own a handgun. No, and you know, it's funny. If you want to own an illegal handgun, it's quite that's an easy, easy. process. I'll, I'll get students that will come to my school, um, uh, minorities, non-minorities, and they'll say, I want to buy a gun. I'm going to go across the street to the gun store and buy one. When I explain the process, they're like, w when did this start, you know? And I'm like, well, about 45 years ago. Right. I think they go into Ancestry.com. That's how far back yeah, they Yeah, you, you have to, you have <laughs> to submit, you know, Eddie, me mental health background, yes. fingerprints, references. They have to call you and verify your employer. Yep. Uh, you have to wait a minimum of 60 days before you get your firearms ID card. And every time you want to purchase a handgun, you have to go through the same process over again. Yes. And it's of course it's all about the Benjamins, I like to say. Sixty-five dollars, thirty-five dollars, six fifty, two dollars. They nickel exactly. and dime you to death, which is another way of discriminating against lower income people. Right. By, you by, have to pay for by it. correct. By adding prices to it, it restricts people. By having appointments with your police department, you can only make an appointment with the permit officer Tuesday from two to four. So the average worker has to take a day off from work. That's what I had to do. We, we just threatened Asbury Park. Asbury Park had a 10-question test that every citizen that lived in Asbury Park had to take it in front of the police officer and get all 10 questions right to get a permit. A total violation against the law. Right. One of the questions, they used double negatives. The question, I couldn't answer the question, so the question <laughs> was, it is okay not to teach your family about firearm safety. 
I needed an attorney to wow. answer that. So we <laughs> sent, we, yes, we sent Asbury Park a threatening letter, and believe it or not, they pulled the test. Well, good. But it was enacted for about 35 years. So I, I guess we can say that it's really not about gun control, it's more about people control. Oh, oh without a denying doubt. Denying people the right to protect themselves. Without a doubt, and also the government fears an armed citizenry. Let's right. face it, they, they fear us if we have guns because they can't just push us around. Look what's going on in Syria right now, and right. Libya, and right. so many other countries. If it wasn't for uh, arms being snuck into the rebels, they would not be able to fend off their own government. It, it would be complete genocide. When people can't defend themselves, someone comes in, and, and that's it. it. In, in World War II, General Hirohito said it would be impossible to invade mainland USA because behind every blade of grass is that's an American right. with a rifle. <laughs> Okay. That's right. That's exactly why they wouldn't invade. Exactly. You would have to be crazy to invade those, us. Those are the days. Yeah, it's not going to work. <laughs> but but we I see it I see it more and more. We have so many restrictive laws. You know, in New Jersey, we passed one handgun a month. Right. How and does it, that? And it's not really a month. It's from the day of purchase. Correct. Then that thirty-one days so, kicks in. So my argument to anti-gunners is that is the way to cure drunk driving by banning cars or restricting car sales. Is that how you would ban drunk driving? Yeah, we, what we've managed to do in our inner cities across the country is we've managed to demonize the tool as opposed to demonizing the criminal. criminal. A great example is Otis McDonald in Chicago, a Korean War vet, black man. He wanted a handgun to protect himself. Chicago has a complete ban on handguns. He took it to the U.S. Supreme Court, and he won. Right. Do you know it's a year and a half now he still has not gotten a handgun? Because Chicago has implemented such restrictive uh, paperwork and visits to the police department that the Second Amendment Foundation is taking uh, the Chicago back to court for Otis McDonald because he has still not gotten the handgun that he won the right to procure through the U.S. Supreme Court. If that's not discrimination, I don't know what is. It's absurd because Chicago is a place where the, the whole city is falling apart. All these major cities, what do they look like, right? I mean, they're all falling apart. They mm -hmm. got their people kind of subservient to come and help us if something happens. And you think it's a coincidence that their crime rates are, are ridiculously high or they can't... 40 uh, people dead Memorial Day weekend and they have a complete ban on handguns. Right. And last year they're telling professional ball players, don't bother going down uh, to downtown Chicago. It's too dangerous for you. So the state doesn't have control of the situation, yet the citizenry is supposed to sit there... Like sitting like, ducks. Like sitting ducks. Eddie, there's been two su U.S. Supreme Court rulings that the police are not obligated to protect you. Two times people took the, U, the, the police departments to court because they weren't there to protect them. One was a, a, a rape and another uh -huh. one was a murder. And the Supreme Court said, we don't have enough police. We can't guarantee your safety. So there was a famous quote by a, a, one of my mentors, Colonel Jeff Cooper, said, when you need help in seconds, the police arrive in minutes, exactly. if you're lucky. Average response time in New Jersey is 14 minutes now for police. Average I response I, I time. I call for them to come onto my street. That We were invaded by a gang of kids. How long and did it take? It, I kept looking out that window. It was it was over ten minutes, and then they they weren't so lucky in even dispersing them at a, at a quick enough rate. You know, even they had problems. So, but you know, I had peace of mind knowing that I wasn't a sitting duck. <laughs> and and I've I've seen such a increase in firearms ownership the past few years. Yes. And. Uh, People ask me all the time, what does my average student look like? And I tell them that every day in my school, it looks like Noah's Ark. I get every size, shape, color, and religious domination walking through the door <laughs> and political affiliation that wants to learn how to shoot a gun Absolutely. and wants to learn how to buy a gun. And women are one of the fastest growing demographics mm -hmm. now. Yeah, right. They want to protect me themselves. It took me a while to get my permit. When the sergeant called me, he goes, what is going on? We are inundated with permits. Yes. And I said, have you read the paper? <laughs> People want firearms, and, when, and you know when we when we were at uh, your facility and had an event there, I mean we had women in their 60s coming there learning to shoot. I get shoot. that all the time. And it it is a cross section. People are really feeling the need of wanting to know that they can protect themselves. They that they can't depend on the police, and they can't you know they have to depend upon themselves, which is. There, you know. What is wrong with a law-abiding citizen exercising their Second Amendment and owning a gun, whether it's a rifle, pistol, or shotgun, and having it in their house? so that if something should ever happen, they can protect their family. Absolutely. You know, the Second Amendment is not about hunting. No. That's what, that's what most of it our politicians will us. say. <laughs> it's about protecting yourself and pre pre preventing tyranny from our own, within our own government. You know, I right. just read a story yesterday, and this is not to equate, this is not to say that this should be responded to in violence in any way, but I read a story about a 
a, a gentleman in Arizona, a pastor who was having Bible study at his house, was arrested because he was having Bible studies at his house. And he, you know, he's being fined. All of a sudden, now to have a to to gather is something that's right. needs to be the First you Amendment, have to have and then which is to, why to we need our Bible Second study Amendment. As a pastor <laughs> at your house, this has become a crime in the country. And I'm not saying that a gun is needed to solve that problem, but getting back to the Second Amendment exists to protect the First Amendment. Correct. You know, exactly. Our First Amendment is being squashed. The Second Amendment is being squashed. And you go down the line, you know, are, are people just aware now? Do you find that they're just sensing that tyranny that is changing. a wave that is coming? That, I mean, do you find that? when? Yeah, when people are buying guns, too, because they feel they're going to be grandfathered in. If a ban comes, I have mine already. In 1993, Florio banned certain firearms. I had 90 days to turn them in or sell them or ship them out of state. So firearms confiscation happened 20 years ago. It can happen again tomorrow. Right. So grandfathering in is not going to help you. Voting and being active will probably help and you. And being an educated voter. And having someone actually to vote for. In New Jersey, unfortunately, we can only usually vote for an F or a D-rated gun candidate. We never see exactly. any A's or we B's. Don't see that. Yeah, we Why have do you think that is? Are there really nobody, is there anybody out there? But people don't think it's as important. Maybe we, not before they didn't think it was as important, but maybe as time goes on, they will see the importance In, in New Jersey, it. we could fit all of our pro-gun politicians in a Mini Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> How many of them have an A rating? For those of you About are four. At the Mini Cooper four. is a very small vehicle. <laughs> About four have an A rating with the NRA. That would be the Mini Cooper. That would be it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, an educated, you know, getting educated on these issues is going to be the most important. But when we come back from the break, I want to talk about how the, uh, well, we're going to talk about that.